want to start. And uh, because I thought it was very important that uh, at least our undergraduate community, as well as our the six form students who are in the Manchester region, uh, get a good sense of what uh, the French response to the January terrorist attack has been and how we could try and explain the specificity of the French Republic when it comes to dealing with racial difference, including Islam. And uh, so that talk had been planned for way before the summer, and it's very tragic that, of course, its top content and topic is uh, becoming, uh, or has become even more topical uh, since the last um, 10 days or so. So with this in mind, um, I will not be discussing the most recent terrorist attack, although, as you see, there is something that connects them more broadly to the history of France, including especially its post-colonial history which is uh, partly my focus this evening. So um, I will talk for about uh, 50 minutes, I hope, leaving time for question. Initially, the room, uh, the, the talk was advertised for just an hour, but I really, we all have the room, access to the room until seven o'clock tonight. So really, please feel free to um, ask questions when I'm, when I'm done. And there's a uh, sort of video of the circulating as well on uh, this topic. So I thought with a few pictures that uh, recently, especially in the last 10 days, have often been uh, mentioned together alongside one another in uh, the media, in the coverage of uh, the most recent terrorist attack in France, but also in the UK coverage. And these pictures have to do with the uh, 2005 Bonlieu uh, riots that happened um, in, uh, uh, across the whole country in France, have to do with the uh, colonization of France in Algeria, and I have to do more recently um, with the January and the November uh, terrorist attacks. And there is perhaps a link, well, there, um, obviously we'll argue that it's very different uh, when um, youth burn cars and do not kill anyone in uh, suburban France and when uh, terrorists do kill people. But um, perhaps there is a hidden link between all these events and um, my contention, of course, is that that link is actually theoretical, conceptual, and to do with French national identity, the way the French think of themselves and uh, explain their relationship uh, to others within uh, the official discourse and also in cultural practice. So I will start the talk by um, giving you definitions of concepts and start by talking about identity and national identity and French national identity, and gradually coming to um, the post-colonial setup in which recent events, tragic events, are taking place. Okay. So I start with identity. Identity is a very broad term, and um, in the academic discourse, and it's perhaps most helpful to understand that it is a dual process. An identity is a perception of oneself as something, that comes from the Latin, meaning the same as. So I understand myself to be as a particular group, as a particular a group of people who have the uh, features that, uh, which I share. But it's also simultaneous. By defining my identity, I also define what I am not. Okay? So it's a constantly dual process of inclusion and expulsion. That's what is specific about thinking of oneself and having an identity. Um, and so, to rephrase that slightly differently, it's like it's a contradictory process as well. It's difficult to have an identity, to verbalize it, to conceptualize it, okay? And it is uh, a process that um, changes with time and that evolves. So, an identity is at once inclusive, exclusive. It's changing with time, although it can be fixed at a moment in time or according to the legal framework in which I express my identity. So an identity could be anything. You know you've got um, um, gender identity, uh, you're feminine, you're masculine, you've got sexual identity, you're heterosexual or you're gay, uh, you've got regional identity, you're from the Northwest, you're a Mount Union, you're not a Geordie. Um, there are all sorts of identities that overlap and juxtapose with one another. The one kind of identity among all these gender, linguistic, faith-based, racial identities that exist is the national identity. And so national identity is a specific kind of contradictory, inclusive, exclusive 
um, way to define oneself as part of a group. And it's uh, to belonging to a national group. And so here it's important to understand the meaning of the word a nation. And a nation is basically a political community. It's a particular kind of group defined by a, a, a feeling of belonging to that group, but defined by a political framework. So um, there are all sorts of different political frameworks. Um, you've got monarchies, you've got constitutional monarchies, uh, you've got uh, republican um, 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 political institutions, you've got dictatorships, um, there's all sorts of ways in which to express the nation and to pin it down in a political structure. Okay? And a nation usually goes with a geographical territory. It's not always the case. We can think of some nations that have only recently had a, ter a territorial um, autonomy. For instance, uh, Slovakia. Um, for instance, um, there are still nations that don't have a geographical territory with clear frontiers. Uh, the Kurds, for instance, or the uh, Palestinians. So a nation does not always go hand in hand with a national territory, although ideally it does. And that would be creating, um, pinning down the nation to a particular uh, country, geographical boundaries. Okay? And so a nation perhaps is most when most um, uh, typically defined, especially in academia, by uh, somebody called Benedict Anderson. Uh, and it's the text that uh, you will find academics keep going back to. Uh, he says that a nation is an imagined political community. Uh, it's imagined because the members of the, even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members. So when um, you think of yourself as belonging to a group and of that group being different from another group, that feeling is very much in your head. Who you think you are and where you think the limits of that similarity of yourself against others stops and starts. That's very much an imagined process that becomes a reality through official discourse, through the media, through cultural representation. Okay? But a nation is a bottle, a political community that is imagined. And the fact that it's imagined doesn't mean it doesn't exist, on the contrary. Imagination can be pinned down and uh, uh, sort of solidified by a series of laws, for instance. Okay? So the political community of a nation can be very concrete and it's concrete at present in France through um, the law that um, all the citizens of France have the same national identity. For instance, I've got my uh, French national identity card. I've been in this country for, uh, I think, 19 years, but I still carry it on me because it's a French habit. Because before moving to the UK, I was in France. And in France, you need your ID card with you in case your identity needs to be verified. Um, so the laws of France, for instance, um, are inflexible at a given moment in time in saying that person belongs to the group, the nation, and that other person does not or does not yet belong to the group of the nation. But it is imagined, as Benedict Anderson said, in the sense that it is symbolic. It's also within the realm of perceptions um, that the nation is meaningful. Okay, so some people might have... Um, what sort of sentimental understanding of what the nation is beyond what the law defines as a set of principles. And so French national identity is visible through a series of symbols, completely arbitrarily chosen, um, a female figure called Madame, uh, a song, a sort of marching song called an atelier, a flag with three colors, these symbols don't have to be, but that's what they are. They are simply have been decided upon by a group of people at a moment in time, and that um, imagination, if you like, has cemented itself and become a series of recognizable signs of unity. But French national identity is really French national identity really. Uh, is defined by yet another concept, one called republicanism. 
Okay? So here I'm moving on to defining what republicanism means, has meant, and continue to mean today. So it's a series of concepts, and we're going to get to um, contemporary history as well. Okay. So if you want to understand French national identity, you need to uh, get to grip with republicanism, because this is the way the French think of themselves, know themselves to be republican, and constantly the official discourse goes back to that term, that notion of republicanism, or as an adjective, the republican state, or for instance on the 11th of January this year after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, there was a big um, a unity march, I think, in the English language. It was impossible to translate republicanism, so instead of uh, calling it the marche républicaine, which was the French chosen by the president, it was called the unity march. The republicanism has a sense, uh, 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 trying to, to convey the sense of unity, of cohesion of the French nation. The republicanism um, is a concept that um, gradually took shape in the 18th century. Okay? Uh, even though it became gradually um, adopted in institutions and in law only during the Third Republic, uh, after 1870. But the ideas of republicanism were shaped in the 18th century, partly, not exclusively, by uh, these famous thinkers here, Voltaire, Rousseau, Rousseau, and they had very large ambitions their main ambition, given the context of the French monarchy in the 18th century and elsewhere in Europe, uh, was to abolish aristocracy, privileges, and uh, to abolish in particular the fact that the head of state, the king, had a divine right to rule, okay? which was a privilege granted by the right of birth. So their ambition is to get rid of a political model and to install a new one where equality and justice is shared among all members. That's a big goal. That's a beautiful goal. And uh, it has been achieved in law today. So um, the, it's very important when I'm going to move on to criticism of republicanism today to a small extent, but it's always important to go back to the origins and to the immense... Um, ambition that uh, Republicans were carrying and trying to implement, uh, which was to provide equality for all when equality did not exist for everyone, when it was only the privilege of uh, two or one percent uh, few in society. Okay? And now, two more concepts. In order to implement the idea of equality for all, the Republican idea that we can all be sharing in the nation, there are two additional concepts that these thinkers um, formulated and which have been adopted, adopted by the political structure and the elite today in France. These two other concepts are humanism and universalism. So of course for the purpose of this lecture I'm going quite fast and I'm simplifying elements of their um, their principle, but trying to go to the essence of it. Okay, first, humanism. Humanism is based on the word for human, a human being, and um, is a theory, a sort of philosophy, interested in putting the human being at the centre of a political project. And that's new in the 18th century. In, to the extent that not all human beings were deemed worthy of being put at the centre of a political project before then. Okay? So humanism shifts the focus from political rights of a happy few to trying to conceive of a society where the political rights can be shared by all humans. Okay? So the it's really a, a, a somehow similar to individualism, okay? in a sense of putting the individual... Uh, to consider the individual when you're framing your political project. The consequence of this is that the individual is more important than the group. The uh, milieu, the background in which an individual is born and, for instance, the family values that are given at birth to an individual should not matter for a political Republican project. It means that the individual can transcend their birth their cultural environment, and in order to be 
sharing in the nation where we are, um, when, in order to feel a, a similarity with the group that is the nation. Okay? So the individual is really asked to transcend what we call the origins of their birth, and in particular the values, the values of their family. Uh, these values could be, for instance, uh, faith-based or uh, social and economic. Okay? It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich, you could transcend that within a new political project, giving equality to everyone. So that's a nice idea, but really the philosophers were themselves very conscious of their own limitations in formulating such an ambitious project. And humanism really is a political model of governance and saying that the only way in which we can hope to grant equality to everyone when we are at birth so very different. Some of us are short, some of us are tall, some of us are able-bodied, some of us are disabled, some of us are, are men and women and so on. There are so many differences that are actually building unequal individuals. So at least what humanism and republicanism can try to do is to give equality to all politically in law. Okay? And in that sense, to build citizens. So I'll explain a little bit more how the French conceive of that citizen body that guarantees equality for everyone, despite differences. For the Republic, who have adopted that model of humanism, there is here a Frenchman, a Frenchwoman. Um, this is a French person here. Okay, they've got their ID card. That's fine. And a second person comes along, because you need at least two people to create a group, to create a nation. And, oh, he's different. He's a bit orange, and he doesn't look very happy. Okay, so these two people are different. But in law, the Republic says that it doesn't matter if one is happy and the other is sad, because in law, there is a commonality between them, and that commonality is what the Republic guarantees. Okay? And so the Republic, its sphere of influence, its sphere of control, and where it builds the idea of a nation is within the similarity between the black man and the orange man, between the happy one and the unhappy one. That circle here and what is inside, what is common to these two different people, is their citizenship as French nationals. They have the same legal rights. They can have the same legal duties. Okay? They will both be carrying the same national identity card delivered by the French Republic. Okay? So in that sphere, which is quite an abstract sphere, we're now talking at the level of political and philosophical ideas, French men and French women are similar. They're similar only at the level of citizenship. And so that so, sort of cent circle here is what the, the inside of the circle is what the Republic calls the public sphere. Public, in French, refers to republic. Okay? It's what is common to everyone. What's common to everyone is the citizenship. What is beyond the circle is your private self. Okay? So you could be from Lille or from Marseille and speaking French with a different accent. You could be a man or a woman. You could be a Christian or a Muslim. That's irrelevant to the political project of the Republic. That's separate, that's private, that stays at home, that is not where equality is aiming to be, is, is, is achieved, okay? It's the um, centrality is a more sort of an abstract concept. And so the public sphere of identity is where citizenship happens and it's where legal equality takes place. And now the French have several ways of reformulating that idea with little slogans that are repeated, passed down, especially throughout the 20th century. One of them is the idea that la république est une et indivisible. The French Republic is one and indivisible. There is just one way to be part of the Republic, and it's to be a republic, to be a republican. It's kind of a circular definition. But it means that whatever is part of your private self is your private sphere, does not traverse, does not come into the political project of the Republic. There's another way that the French have, another sort of slogan that the French have, 
as liberté, égalité, fraternité. And again, that slogan really is achieved within the law, the legal parameters of the public sphere. That's the sphere of control um, of uh, the state. That's where the nation is realized. And there is a second uh, concept which I announced previously, is universalism. Universalism is very similar to some extent to humanism. But it's the idea that not only the individual is at the center of um, the state, of its uh, political structure, but that uh, whatever is decided for one person can apply to all. So it's universal in a sense that it applies to all citizens. So the state guarantees the same rights for all its citizens. The values of the republic must apply to all its citizens. Okay? So it's a sort of spreading of, um, of whatever the state offers. And there are different ways in which the French state has, throughout the last 120 years, um, cemented that approach to law. Uh, for instance, the French state has developed a centralization policy uh, guaranteeing that the same more or less the same uh, schooling takes place uh, up and down the country and overseas where it's got uh, colonial and um, regional territories. Okay. That the state controls uh, uh, health services, transport. Okay. And there are many ways in which the French state tries to provide the same care to all its citizens thanks to its centralization effort. Another way in which universalism applies today is through um, the use of language. In the 19th century in France, um, many languages were spoken uh, by uh, the people uh, from Breton to Occitan to Corsican and Alsatian. Um, that disappeared thanks to or due to a policy of linguistic unity, of linguistic universalism, where French was chosen as the language of the republic nothing else, and that, therefore, all the um, um, duties of the, um, uh, the government and then trickling down to all spheres of cultural interaction have to be done in French. Okay? So uh, that's an, a, a sort of early development at the end of the 19th century. Quickly after that, the French state decided that it also was going to be secular, Secular means that it is not interested in matters of uh, religion. It is neutral towards all religion. So it lets everyone have a religion outside of the citizenship sphere in their private uh, life. And then a final thing in which the French state is uh, trying to be universal, to achieve its ambition of universalism, is through the integration of foreigners. Now, actually, integration is the oldest principle in action in French law since the medieval period, since at least 1515. There are records of uh, the law protecting the identity and the um, inheritance of foreigners living in France. Um, and that principle of integration means that any foreigner who um, has moved to France, and especially if they've had children in France, when they die, can pass down their uh, belongings, uh, their wealth, to their children. Previously, it, they would have been confiscated because by the state or the sort of local region and lord, because they uh, were foreigners. Okay? And France was one of the first countries in Western Europe to uh, protect the um, integrity, including the financial integrity, of foreigners residing in France. This, um, uh, this law has evolved to become uh, the law of integration that we know today, and uh, it's never really been questioned. Um, and uh, so still today, uh, a foreign resident, provided they live for a certain number of years uh, in a French territory, can become French, and their children will automatically become French between the ages of 16 and 18. So France is a welcoming and generous country for foreign populations. 
This is a principle that is uh, uh, verbalized by the Office, uh, comment s'appelle, Office uh, Français de l'Immigration et de l'Intégration, so a, a branch of the, uh, um, uh, of one of the ministries welcoming uh, foreigners. This is the uh, discourse uh, published on the ministry's website. Oh, I'll read it out in French. Fidèle à sa tradition d'accueil et d'intégration, la France conduit en matière d'immigration une politique faite de générosité et d'humanisme. Okay, so generosity and humanism are the core values of republicanism. Okay, and you see the reference to humanism understood in pair with generosity. You can be a foreigner and uh, gradually become French. You know, or become French. La preuve. Uh, recently we had a head of state, Nicolas Sarkozy, born in France, whose dad was not born in France, but in Hungary. He married a lady not born in France, who actually to this day does not have French national identity, and that's fine, she's Italian. Um, the French squad, uh, football squad in 1998, who won the very famous World Cup, 3-0 to Brazil. Um, a, a lot of them uh, were descendants of uh, foreign nationals, including somebody who did score two goals that uh, day, uh, Zinedine Zidane, uh, of parents from Algeria. But he's born in Marseille. Last year, Miss France, so whose title is to embody the beauty of the French nation, uh, her mother comes from Benin, uh, an old colonial, an ex-colonial territory in, the, in Western Africa. Okay. So integration in France is a true principle of the Republic and gradually brings in more foreigners into the French fold of the nation of citizenship. So it's all good, good and well in France. I wouldn't be here tonight. I'm just going to look at the time it is and see if I can. It's perfect. Okay. <coughs> so, yes, um, there are problems with integration in France today. And I will start um, by showing perhaps that the problems of integration are not. Um, are not because of the foreigners who come to France, but because of the way the French have themselves framed their notion of integration. And so one of the problems with the French um, concept of republicanism and the French application of integration today lies actually in the wording of the generosity principle I had just shown. I'm going back to the previous slide. This is how the same message from the Office de l'Immigration continues. So, fidèle à sa tradition d'accueil et d'intégration, la France conduit en matière d'immigration une politique faite de générosité et d'humanisme. Yes, but carries on. Avec comme ligne d'horizon le dépassement des valeurs d'origine, l'adhésion à des valeurs communes qui sont celles de la République. So, in the same breath, what the French state is proposing is that the valeurs d'origine, the values of origin that you are born with, that your family has passed down to you, by natural and uh, sort of cultural uh, acclimatation, these values are suspicious. There's a lot of assumptions in the Republican understanding of citizenship. One of these assumptions here written clearly is that valeurs d'origine are meant to be dépassé. You're meant to be able to reach beyond whatever values are at home, part of your uh, private sphere. Okay? So it's not quite enough to uh, conceptualize yourself as having a private sphere and a public sphere where you are a legal citizen just like another legal citizen. But somehow you should lean towards being much more in the public sphere than in the private sphere. So valeurs d'origine need to be dépassé, reached beyond. Okay? And there's another assumption um, in here, of course, is that the valeurs d'origine, so the values of origin, uh, um, values of birth, um, risk fragmenting the nation. The reason why the Republicans or the Republican system fears um, about, uh, is afraid of these valeurs d'origine is that they think that if you um, present them too much, if you foreground them too much, 
they will somehow impinge on the public sphere of commonality and distort that commonality that is the stable block of our nation. And valeurs d'origine are dangerous, suspicious, and risk fragmenting our national unity. That is the Republican assumption. That Republican assumption also works because it's significant and it kind of appears meaningful for many French people, including all our official um, heads of state and governments and so on, because they assume that the public sphere where we express our commonality as citizens is neutral, can remain neutral and will forever be neutral. And therefore, if it's neutral and you kind of break your way into with something very personal and very different from someone else, therefore you might risk breaking down, fragmenting, destabilizing that neutrality of the public sphere. But that is a big assumption because nothing is neutral in reality. And the French Republic in particular is the legacy of historical, economic, social, cultural, racial, religious um, features like anything else. And so the French Republic is not neutral. So the Republican assumptions, okay, valeur d'origine, suspicious, excessive visibility will fragment the public sphere is neutral. It isn't. For instance, it has been built as French-speaking, Catholic, often Parisian, educated, middle class, straight versus gay, and white and masculine. So all these are absolutely not neutral features, although by default they come to define what some white, French, straight, educated, Parisian, Catholic, French-speaking men believe to be. The problem is, if you believe in that assumption, yes, of course, any expression, any deviation from that rule, that neutrality, uh, appears shocking and risks fragmenting the stability of the nation. And so there are differences that matter in France, but for different, um, there are different ways to react against them. There are differences which the French state has learned to cope with and to accept as differences and to legislate upon them as differences. For instance, gender. Uh, women are different from men and it was not until 1945 that women got the right to vote. So for 150 years when the republican ideas influenced by humanism were being uh, put into, tried out during um, a series of, uh, through institutions and so on, half of the population was considered too different to be included in the republican model of citizenship. Okay, but at the end of the Second World War, at last, women were recognized as different and at last included in, um, in the sphere. And they are still recognized as different today. For instance, they are allowed maternity leave for longer than the paternity leave. Okay? So women have different bodies with different needs and the state can recognize, legislate that difference and protect it. It's able to do that. So the French state can be flexible with difference. Same goes for ability, disability, for regional difference. There are some schools in Brittany since the late 1980s that are bilingual and offering tuition in the Breton language to the French pupils. Um, and uh, for the best part of 100 years prior to that, uh, Breton was illegal. Okay? So there is a recognition that there are particular cultural, regional needs, ethnic needs in, Bre in Bretagne, in Brittany, that are different from elsewhere and that we can legislate about and recognize. So that's nice. Now, lots of sexuality as well, the law to um, authorize um, gay civil partnerships. That's a very recent shift uh, and, and, and something that the Republic can accept. Okay? So there are a lot of differences that the state will cope with. At present, there is one form of difference that the French state is still finding hard to swallow and to act upon, and it's racial difference faith difference in particular, the fact that Islam is present on the French territory, 
and that these two differences together, race and faith, have built a particular figure, a very imaginary figure in the minds of many French men and women, a figure that the French tend to call the Arab. Arab. Um, it is inadequate, but it is the word commonly used in French popular discourse to identify the person that doesn't fit. The person who's different really is too much. Okay? And um, that, um, there are lots of, um, of course, it goes back to the colonial uh, period where France had um, a very uh, painful uh, clash with Algeria during the Second World War. Uh, before that, it uh, goes back to the fact that for the best part of 100 and more, 60 years, um, the French state led a policy of a racist um, supremacy of the white were superior to black people during the colonial expansion, the colonial empire of France. Um, and uh, more generally, there's a sense that race is a feature that is really too much when it's visible in the public sphere. So race in the Republic can be a problem. Race here, I'm just using to, uh, to define it as skin color. That's what is visible in people's appearance. It's their somatic features. Somatic is just another word to say they're physical particularities. So I'm petite, I've quite, got quite a, a, a narrow face, um, I've got olive skin, I've got frizzy hair. Uh, that's my somatic features. Okay? And often I'm, I'm, I'm asked if I'm from North Africa. So there's an assumption that that kind of physique is dominant in North Africa or in the Mediterranean. Okay? Um, so race is how people's appearance uh, is assessed by oneself and by others. And the Republic, as a humanist universal uh, system, is very clear in law that it is colorblind. It is non-racist. It's so non-racist that race is immaterial to the Republican project. Okay? Race is just not mentioned and not, um, I it's irrelevant to uh, Republican equality because anyway, uh, the uh, Republic is uh, colorblind. But there's a problem with that in that uh, recently since the uh, 1970s, um, the oil crisis, um, this, the beginning of unemployment, um, there have been um, uh, far-right parties, especially the National Front, um, really having a very non-Republican discourse by mentioning race in their speeches and making race important to their political expansion, their political project. And unfortunately, because the National Front has twisted the word race, which is a visible reality, to uh, link it with their own racist agenda of separating between different races, of creating hierarchies between different races, um, the left and the mainstream uh, conservative right-wing parties have not wanted to um, confront the National Front on that issue and to reappropriate race as a social reality that matters for people. Um, so race today, by all the mainstream political parties in power, which are the Republican parties, is never discussed um, in debates, uh, in official speeches. And the word race is just not used at all. It's a very, um, it's understood to be a very naughty word, a taboo word in France. You don't say race, uh, that uh, often the French think you might be racist by talking about race. Um, but of course, race exists, okay? It is visible. It is a somebody, something in, in your skin color, in your appearance. So what matters then is how race is dealt with in the social reality of French interactions, of daily life. And there are, of course, because of France's colonial history and post-colonial immigration, different kinds of racial minorities in France against a white majority. The ma racial majority in France is still white because of its history, its location in Western Europe. And there are racial minorities, which are often we, the French call them visible, because that's the only way they can't say the word race, but they will say something about one's appearance. 
So there are visible ethnic minorities in France who can have black skin, brown skin, or be apparently from North Africa. So the problem really with race, given the Republican theory, conceptualization of identity, is that race, because it is so much literally in your face, cannot be separated between the private and the public sphere. And that is the republic's problem, that when somebody is visibly different, they remain visibly different in the so-called public sphere of participation, of uh, neutrality of the republic. So if I go back to my little French men, here we've got one person who's one colour, another one who's one colour, even when you say, well, that's the public sphere, we're all the same here. Abstractly, legally, the French Republic does protect that. But in social reality, in the day-to-day -day interaction, there is a, a gap between the theory of the Republic and the practice of living in France, where race cannot be erased, cannot be moved, cannot be forgotten about, cannot be abstracted out of the person who is also a citizen. And unfortunately, given France's colonial past, in particular violent uh, war of decolonization with Africa, those who suffer the most from the fact that race is visible in social life are the Arabs, or what the French construct as the Arabs, um, often uh, North Africans, okay, so not Arabs from Saudi Arabia, it's a les Arabes in the French uh, cultural understanding, which are um, North African immigrants and their descendants. And so in France, there are instances of racial discrimination, yes. For instance, in the workplace. Um, this is a little cartoon here that says, the, um, so there's a French man wearing a tie who's an employer and who is seeing an employee uh, who looks pretty pissed off and getting perhaps the same reply. And the French person is saying, I wouldn't mind giving you a job, but really, I don't like the color of the color of your tie. Um, so color matters. That French employer has obviously perceived something to be different in the essence of that person, but is not managing to see beyond that and to be a true Republican and to think in abstract terms of commonality, but is talking about color. And so. To demonstrate the uh, reality of racial discrimination, I'm quoting here a, a, a sociological study done by Jean-François Amadieu 10 years ago. Um, Amadieu, with a team of sociologists from um, uh, uh, Nanterre University, distributed two similar CVs. It was uh, testing out em employability and, and racial discrimination. So he was sending out two identical CVs to the same employers uh, in central Paris. And there was one variable of difference between the CVs. One, was, one difference was the um, name of the person. So he was giving an Arab sounding name on one CV with the same qualification. And the same qualification on the other CV was a French sounding name. And then there was another series of tests done with the sort of the French standard um, CV and um, the address uh, as well. So not just the Arab sounding name, but the address where you lived and if it was an in inner city uh, Paris uh, address, which is deemed more um, socially um, uh, affluent or uh, outside of France, especially in the northern, northwest uh, banlieue where there's a, a high concentration of post-colonial immigrants. And the results were shocking. The results showed that more often uh, seven times more often than in the f f white French case, the Arab-sounding character was uh, rejected, not invited for interview. Okay, so it's the stage where you apply for a job and you wait for the interview to come to you, okay, to, to get an interview. And so seven times, is it seven? Yeah, uh, so, no, seven is in the other side, sorry. Um, Consider have so 30% uh, of success to go to an interview for the white candidate, but only 5% of success to go for an interview for the Arab sounding person for the same job, the same qualifications. Okay, so it's an online study. Um, you can um, you could share the PowerPoint if you like, and uh, it's on your handout as well. Okay, so yes, racial discrimination does exist. 
It also exists with a republican institution called the police. Um, the police in France is a complex institution. Uh, it's very differently organized and funded than in Britain. Uh, it's got a very different history and, and perception as well. But uh, one of the jobs of, uh, there are two different types of police. There's called the administrative police and the PJ, the police judiciaire, the sort of judicial police. Um, both groups of police forces have as one of their duties to check national identity of people on the street. Okay, so that's why I'm carrying my ID card with me. Um, it's because in France, at any point, you can be expected to be checked for your national identity, just to check that you are indeed a national resident. Of course, um, European foreigners are uh, very welcome to uh, be in France, but in that case, they should have some sort of ID form authorizing them, showing that they are a EU citizen. Um, and now, uh, there was another interesting study done more recently in the city centre of Paris, just outside Metro, um, metro Gates. Fabien Jobard and another team of uh, sociologists, um, it's a co-authored study, posted themselves outside different metro stations in Paris. And outside the metro station, because you've got a lot of people coming and going, and they were observing the behavior of the police asking people on the street for their identity papers, because that's one of the things the police does, because since we have an ID card, we might as well check it, something to do. Um, and in that study, he found um, that black people is about four and a half times more likely than white people to be stopped, but by far the most obvious discrimination was against Arab-looking characters, okay, the individual. Et les Arabes ont été généralement plus de cette fois, sont more than seven times on average, checked for their uh, national identity. So for the police, it means that there is an assumption on the part of an individual policeman or policewoman <coughs> in city centre Paris, that when you see, so it's a racial impact, when you see somebody who looks maybe a little bit like me, uh, especially if it's a young man, um, they, there's the assumption that they are not French or that there is something suspicious about them because you've got to demonstrate suspicion to go and uh, stop that person. It doesn't mean an arrestation. It just means stopping them uh, on their way to work or wherever and having a 10-minute check of their identity papers. Um, so yes, so racial discrimination does exist, okay? And that other little cartoon is obviously the French cop initially wanting to be really aggressive with the sort of Maghrebin, North African looking person, sort of uh, the shaded skin and the frizzy hair. Um, initially, with the capital letters, it might have been something very rude, uh, using the two form of um, uh, order to uh, the young person but reining himself in and saying, right, okay, I'm going to be polite, I'm going to use the s'il vous plaît uh, instead. So that cartoon is just pointing out to the fact that, yes, um, racial discrimination is widespread among the French police, but it's most importantly verified in situ by uh, a team of sociologists. Okay. So you can see perhaps where the day-to-day um, -day lived experience of racial discrimination especially when you are perceived to be as Arab, um, can be a burden uh, and an incredibly unpleasant life experience for many French men and women who are indeed from uh, North Africa or their parents or their grandparents hailed from these uh, colonial uh, territories. And perhaps partly uh, the feeling of resentment against the police, the feeling of resentment against discrimination has fueled riots in the French banlieue recently. So the, one of the most recent and, um, um, uh, how would I say? Well, I mean, powerful, but sort of widespread uh, example of riots in the banlieue. I mean, there have been some since, since 1979, basically, in, starting in Lyon, very often in Paris and elsewhere. But what was striking about 2005 was the nationwide scale of the f battle between um, banlieue uh, inhabitants, not all from North Africa, of course not, 
uh, but a proportion of them being from North Africa and often having experienced that kind of discrimination and their clash with the police. And the police as representatives of the Republican institution is precisely aiming and co sort of not aiming to but achieving equality in law and uh, granting the same status of citizenship to all its, uh, its uh, citizens. Um, but of course, I think looking at the picture sociologically is interesting because in Clichy sous Bois, which is where the riots of 2005 started before, within 48 hours, spreading nationwide and staying um, on a nationwide scale for three weeks, um, in Clichy sous Bois, the uh, picture economically um, is incredibly bleak. So as well as experiencing racial discrimination, perhaps these youth were also incredibly uh, poor, badly educated, and in a very, um, in geographical terms, dense um, um, neighborhoods. Okay? The density is the number of inhabitants per square kilometer. And so in clichy sous -Bois itself, where's my figure? It's over 7,400 inhabitants per square kilometers. And if I put that in perspective with Manchester, it's 300, uh, it's about the inverted figure, it's 4,100, four I've got it here, sorry. Um, it's around 4,000. So in one banlieue in Paris, outside Paris, clichy sous bois where the riots started, basically the living conditions are particularly awful. Um, is it, is it? I don't want to say anything wrong. Okay, in clichy sous bois 47% um, of, of the population is under 25, so about half the population is very young. That population is 35% unemployed. Um, among North African boys, there's 42% uh, of uh, failure at school, so they don't get to the equivalent of GCSEs even. And the high density of 7,400 inhabitants per square kilometre. Manchester is 4,300. So this almost half the density. And Manchester, I mean, is the third, second biggest city in the UK. Okay? So you increase that density, that number of people per square kilometre. You obviously stack them up vertically in high rise accommodation. And uh, you get the picture of oppression that uh, that little cartoon also um, shows. And what I think is interesting in relation to the tension of the feeling that integration doesn't work for some of these people, um, the analysis from most of the people who went to speak with the rioters, who spent a lot of time in the banlieue trying to understand the sentiment of um, anger and resentment of those who act violently by burning cars, and nobody died during the 2005 riots, other than the two young boys um, which initiated uh, the first riots. <coughs> nobody died uh, at the hands of, of rioters or police. Um, what observers uh, have demonstrated, if you like, is that these people actually are fierce republicans. And what they really, really want is more republic, more concrete realization of the goal of equality, of transparency, of neutrality, of the republic. Okay? They really hold the principle of equality for all, of justice within the public sphere, dear. And it's the realization that that principle fails in economic and social terms that angers them and for them for those who are inclined to violence justifies their violence their violent acts okay so uh, curiously perhaps paradoxically if you like what a lot of um i'm relying mostly on historians and sociologists here um is to say that what uh, people who feel non-integrated or people who the officials might say they are not integrating what these people really want is to integrate. And they really want to see the Republic achieve its goals of equality for all and transparency within the public sphere. 
It's because an employer was not transparent but was racially prejudiced that a CV was rejected. Or it's because a policeman was racially prejudiced that somebody was arrested, not no, no, arrested, sorry, but stopped and searched twice, three times, four times, five times a day. <coughs> that is one of the things that the rioters really uh, expressed their anger again. They said, you can be just stopped by the police so many times a day just because you look different from an implied norm. Okay? But there shouldn't be such a thing as an implied norm in the Republican project if it is to be truly neutral. Okay. <coughs> so sorry, so for, for those who are not French, I'll just quickly read out the slide here. Uh, it says... Um, um, so the, it's based on the, the perspective of the rioters, what the rioters really ask for. Uh, it's a, an, an extreme, uh, their gesture is an extreme and desperate act of uh, request for more integration into contemporary France. Uh, or, second quote, um, it's because the Republic's claim of equality for all is taken seriously by the rioters, that their social, racial, and a spatial experience of discrimination is so intense and so painful that they might uh, be involved in violence. Okay. So I'm just finishing here now. Okay. Um, we must be careful not to simplify solutions and, um, or reasons for anything. And I really don't want people to leave the theatre thinking that I'm providing an easy solution, saying the Republic is racist and the Arabs are poor victims. It would be wrong on at least two counts of oversimplification. First, that the Republic is not racist, because in law it does protect all its citizens. Society, some people in society, might be racially discriminating, but that happens everywhere, in France and elsewhere, and perhaps in France less so than elsewhere. The second thing, of course, is wrong to say the Arabs are victims, because there is no such thing as the Arabs. That's just lumping together, perhaps based on the racial prejudice on our, on our part, and there is no um, justification for uh, um, creating that sort of vague uh, denomination. Okay. Um, besides, what is interesting, of course, is that, for instance, in the UK, where the discourse, the official state discourse, um, is much more at ease with the language of racial politics, with mentioning racial difference, um, with perhaps often letting people, including Muslim, express themselves, authorizing them to wear a hijab in the public sphere when they're teachers or their uh, secondary school children, for instance, that is not happening in France. So even in Britain, where that uh, apparent and uh, that official discourse of, of respect, of inclusion and ease towards race is a reality, you still get tensions, problems, riots, and of course also terrorism. But terrorism is a very different uh, kettle of fish, and I don't really want to go there now. Okay. So let's try and have a, a happy note, if we can, for the end. It's especially for the sixth forms, six form students who are here tonight and for all the undergraduates. But of course, education, knowledge, your capacity to be critical and to deal with complex ideas is what is needed. Studying at university is essential to move beyond facile, simple uh, solutions or interpretation of a particular trend, a particular event, uh, a particular social tension. Okay? So, uh, in particular, students here, I do hope you carry on with your languages uh, in the many years to come. Okay? I'm very happy to take questions. I'm done. Thank you.